The Call of the Wild Chapter 7 The Sound of the Call When Buck earned $1,600 in five minutes for John Thornton, he made it possible for his master to pay off certain debts and to journey with his partners into the East after a fabled lost mine, the history of which was as old as the history of the country. Many men had sought it, few had found it, and more than a few there were who had never returned from the quest. The lost mine was steeped in tragedy and shrouded in mystery. No one knew of the first man. The oldest tradition stopped before it got back to him. From the beginning, there had been an accident in a ramshackle cabin. Dying men had sworn to it and to the mine, the site of which it marked, clinching their testimony with nuggets that were unlike any known grade of gold in the Northland. But no living man had looted this treasure house, and the dead were dead. Wherefore, John Thornton and Pete and Hans, with Buck and half a dozen other dogs, faced into the east on an unknown trail to achieve where men and dogs as good as themselves had failed. They sledded 70 miles up the Yukon, swung to the left into the Stewart River, passed the Mayo and the McQuestion, and held on until the Stewart itself became a streamlet, threading the upstanding peaks which marked the backbone of the continent. John Thornton asked little of man or nature. He was unafraid of the wild. With a handful of salt and a rifle, he could plunge into the wilderness and fare wherever he pleased, as long as he pleased. Being in no haste, Indian fashion, he hunted his dinner in the course of the day's travel, and if he failed to find it, like the Indian, he kept on traveling, secure in the knowledge that sooner or later he would come to it. So this great journey into the east, straight meat was the bill of fare. Ammunition and tools principally made up the load on the sled. And the time card was drawn upon the limitless future. To Buck, it was boundless delight, this hunting, fishing, and indefinite wandering through strange places. For weeks at a time, they would hold on steadily, day after day, and for weeks upon end, they would camp here and there. The dogs loafing and the men burning holes through the frozen muck, and gravel, and washing countless pans of dirt by the heat of the fire. Sometimes they went hungry. Sometimes they feasted riotously, all according to the abundance of gain and the fortune of hunting. Summer arrived, and dogs and men, packs on their backs, rafted across blue mountain lakes, and descended or ascended unknown rivers in slender boats whipsawed from the standing forest. The months came and went, back and forth they twisted through the uncharted vastness, where no men were yet and where men had been if the lost cabin were true. They went across the divides in summer blizzards, shivered under the midnight sun on naked mountains between the timberline and the eternal snows, dropped into summer valleys amid swarming gnats and flies, and in the shadows of glaciers picked strawberries and flowers as ripe and fair as any of the Southland could boast. In the fall of the year, they penetrated a weird lake country, sad and silent, where wildfowl had been, but where then there was no life nor sign of life, only the blowing of chill winds, the forming of ice in sheltered places, and the melancholy rippling of waves on lonely beaches. And through another winter they wandered on the obliterated trails of men who had gone before. Once they came upon a path blazed through the forest, an ancient path, and the lost cabin seemed very near. But the path began nowhere and ended nowhere, and remained a mystery as the man who made it and the reason he made it remained a mystery. Another time they chanced upon the time-graven wreckage of a hunting lodge, and amid the shreds of rotted blankets, John Thornton found a long-barreled flintlock. He knew it for a Hudson Bay Company gun, 
of the young days in the Northwest when such a gun was worth its weight in beaver skins packed flat. And that was all. No hint as to the man who, in the early day, had reared the lodge and left the gun among the blankets. Spring came on once more, and at the end of their wandering, they found not the lost cabin, but a shallow placer in a broad valley where the gold showed like yellow butter across the bottom of the washing pan. They sought no further. Each day they worked earned them thousands of dollars in clean dust and nuggets as they worked every day. The gold was sacked in moose hide bags, 50 pounds to the bag, and piled like so much firewood outside the spruce bow lodge. Like giants they toiled, days flashing on the heels of days like dreams as they heaped the treasure up. There was nothing for the dogs to do save hauling in of meat now and again that Thornton killed, and Buck spent long hours musing by the fire. The vision of the short-legged hairy man came to him more frequently, now that there was little work to be done, and often, blinking by the fire, Buck wandered with him in that other world which he remembered. The salient thing of this other world seemed fear. When he watched the hairy man sleeping by the fire, head between his knees and hands clasped above, Buck saw that he slept restlessly with many starts and awakenings, at which times he would peer fearfully into the darkness and fling more wood upon the fire. Did they walk by a beach of the sea where the hairy man gathered shellfish and ate them as he gathered? It was with eyes that roved everywhere for hidden danger and with legs prepared to run like the wind at its first appearance. Through the forest they crept noiselessly. Buck at the hairy man's heels, and they were alert and vigilant, the pair of them, ears twitching and moving and nostrils quivering, for the man heard and smelled as keenly as Buck. The hairy man could spring up into the trees and travel ahead as fast as on the ground, swinging by the arms from limb to limb, sometimes a dozen feet apart, letting go and catching, never falling, never missing his grip. In fact, he seemed as much at home among the trees as on the ground. And Buck had memories of nights of vigil spent beneath the trees wherein the hairy man roosted, holding on tightly as he slept. And closely akin to the visions of the hairy man was the call still sounding in the depths of the forest. It filled him with a great unrest and strange desires. It caused him to feel a vague, sweet gladness. And he was aware of wild yearnings and stirrings, for he knew not what. Sometimes he pursued the call into the forest, looking for it as though it were a tangible thing, barking softly and defiantly as the mood might dictate. He would thrust his nose into the cool wood moss or into the black soil where the long grasses grew and snort with joy at the fat earth smells. Or he would crouch for hours as if in concealment, behind fungus-covered trunks of fallen trees, wide-eyed and wide-eared to all that moved and sounded about him. It might be lying thus that he hoped to surprise this call he could not understand, but he did not know why he did these various things. He was impelled to do them and did not reason about them at all. Irresistible impulses seized him. He would be lying in camp, dozing lazily in the heat of the day when suddenly his head would lift and his ears cock up, intent and listening, and he would spring to his feet and dash away and on and on for hours through the forest aisles and across the open spaces where the nigger heads bunched. He loved to run down dry water courses and to creep and spy upon the bird life in the woods. For a day at a time, he would lie in the underbrush where he could watch the partridges drumming and strutting up and down. But especially, he loved to run in the dim twilight of the summer's midnights, listening to the subdued and sleepy murmurs of the forest, reading signs and sounds as man may read a book, and seeking for the mysterious something that called, called waking or sleeping at all times for him to come. 
One night, he sprang from his sleep with a start, eager-eyed, nostrils quivering and scenting, his mane bristling in recurrent waves. From the forest came the call, or one note of it, for the call was many noted, distinct and definite as never before, a long-drawn howl, like yet unlike any noise made by a husky dog. And he knew it in the old familiar way as a sound heard before. He sprang through the sleeping camp and in swift silence dashed through the woods. As he drew closer to the cry, he went more slowly with caution in every movement, till he came to an open place among the trees, and looking out, saw erect on haunches, with nose pointed to the sky, a long, lean timber wolf. He had made no noise, yet it ceased from its howling and tried to sense his presence. Buck stalked into the open, half crouching, body gathered compactly together, tail straight and stiff, feet falling with unwanted care. Every movement advertised commingled threatening and overture of friendliness. It was the menacing truce that marks the meeting of wild beasts that prey. But the wolf fled at sight of him. He followed with wild leapings and a frenzy to overtake. He ran him into a blind channel in the bed of the creek where a timber jam barred the way. The wolf whirled about, pivoting on his hind legs after the fashion of Joe and of all cornered husky dogs, snarling and bristling, clipping his teeth together in continuous and rapid succession of snaps. Buck did not attack, but circled him about and hedged him in with friendly advances. The wolf was suspicious and afraid, for Buck made three of him in wait, while his head barely reached Buck's shoulders. Watching his chance, he darted away, and the chase was resumed. Time and again he was cornered, and the thing repeated, though he was in poor condition, or Buck could not so easily have overtaken him. He would run till Buck's head was even with his flank, when he would whirl around at bay, only to dash away again at the first opportunity. And as we're beginning to run a little long, I think we'll pause here and pick this up in the next video. Sticker says ta-ta for now. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.